you take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 14. Our text this morning is verses 18 through 21. John 14, verses 18 through 21. Beginning in verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. On this final night before the crucifixion, Jesus spends this time in the upper room providing comfort for his disciples who were in a sea of despair with their troubled hearts. And so Jesus comforts them with several promises and We've gone over these, as we've gone through these verses over the last several months, he begins with the promise of heaven, promising them right off the bat. He promises them of his second coming, that he's going to come again. He promises them an assurance of faith. Uh, he says, you know the way, because I am the way. He promises them a continuing mission. Greater works than these will you do. Speaking of the spread of the gospel message, it will be greater in extent than even the work that Jesus did as he walked the earth. He promised them that they would have answered prayers. Ask anything in my name and my Father will give it to you. Then he promises them the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Helper. These disciples, as troubled as they were, this, they were not thinking in these terms of these promises at that time. They were really more concerned with who they were losing rather than being comforted by who they were and what they were gaining. Jesus proceeds, though, to give them the bigger picture in our verses this morning, they are going to be in union with the triune God, starting now. But this is only going to happen if Jesus goes to the cross, if Jesus accomplishes his work on the cross and is to rise again. These promises then will become a reality. This is beyond comprehension for them. This is beyond comprehension for us. Uh, this was meant to provide them with comfort, but at this time we see it might not have provided them with the comfort that it would later. In fact, he says right after this, a few verses later, in verse 27, he, he repeats what he said in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be Afraid. In chapter 16, verse 20, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. They were, at this time, troubled. They would not experience the joy of these promises until later. And Jesus, even though they could not understand everything Jesus was saying, Jesus does give them assurance that soon you're going to get it. Soon you're going to understand it. Right now, not so much, but you're going to. He says in verse 20, in that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. The mutual indwelling of the Father and the Son and the union of the triune God and the believer you don't understand this now, but you're, you're going to understand it later. As I reflected 
on these verses this week, I began to wonder if, if Christians, if the church, if they reflect on the promises of Christ. If Christians do that, I wonder if they do. The reality of suffering is reality. It is very real. In varying degrees, every human, all people will experience uh, suffering of some sort. Again, varying degrees do we experience it. But as people of faith, that is those that are sold out to Christ, those that are, have truly been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and have experienced regeneration, have experienced that new birth, that are followers of Christ, people of faith in the one true living God. I, I wonder if for those of true Christian faith, if suffering, yes, it's real. Yes, it happened. Yes, we experience it. I wonder if it should look markedly different from that of the world. And I say, yes, it should look different. That doesn't mean we don't have that suffering, but how we understand it, how we deal with it, how we live through it, that is going to look different amongst the people of faith. Because Jesus gives us these promises. Because Jesus gives us this bigger picture of things. And if that's true, and if those promises are the reality of the Christian life right now, it should look very different how we do handle suffering. You know, look, that's why we've gone through each of these promises so slowly. And that's why we, we begin by reminding ourselves of them, because it's good to be reminded of the promises of God constantly, to have the gospel message preached in our lives daily. I believe it's a necessity to Christian health, to growth in our faith. This promise that Jesus is, is giving them is not new. But just consider the children of Israel. Moses walked with them as their leader for 40 years. And he became their leader through the most amazing, spectacular, supernatural horrific even uh, events recorded in the Bible. The Exodus became the theme all the way through the Old Testament. Remember the Exodus. And so through that time, Moses was their leader. For 40 years, they experienced his leadership. They depended upon Moses as their mediator, as the one who would speak to God for them. You can imagine the attachment they had to Moses. In fact, Deuteronomy 34.8 gives us an idea of the pain when Moses dies. It says, And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. And the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. They were in incredible grief when Moses died. The leader was no longer there. <clears throat> You know, prior to that, Moses gave them some parting words. And he said, look, guys, I'm 120 years old. I'm dying. It's time to go. Listen to what he says to them as part of his final words. Because it's almost exactly what Jesus tells his disciples. He says in chapter 31, verse 6 of Deuteronomy, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. Listen to what he says. He will not leave you or forsake you. Yahweh, your God, will go with you. You don't need to fear. Because God will never leave you. Consider what Jesus says. Jesus, the mediator of a new and better covenant. He tells his disciples, you will be in a living union with the triune God forever. 
eternal life now. That is the reality of the Christian life. Communion with God. Communion with God. How is this applied? Well, I think a couple of ways that come out from the text is first is this is the idea of a, that we are dependent. Dependency should lead us to recognizing the sovereignty of the triune God. Now, how do we recognize that God is sovereign? How do we recognize that in how we live our lives, how we function, uh, how we understand scripture? How do we understand the sovereignty of God? I think it's by first realizing our dependence upon Him. That's dependency. That we are dependent upon Him. It's kind of like recognizing our need for a Savior. We don't recognize our need for a Savior until we first recognize that we're sinful, we're depraved, we're wretched, and we need a Savior. When we, when we grasp that, then we, need, we realize we need a Savior. It's the same way that we recognize that God is sovereign, is that we recognize we're fully and wholly, completely dependent upon Him for our very uh, breath, the air we breathe for my beating heart right at this very second. I am completely and wholly dependent upon Him, whether I live in recognition of that or not. Notice the words that Jesus uses in making this very clear. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This is a very revealing statement, what Jesus says. In, in chapter 13, verse 33, he says to them, little children. And then here he says and uses the word orphans. And what is he doing here? Is he is recognizing his or revealing to them that he is sovereign over them. They are dependent upon him for everything. And he reassures them of one thing. I'm not going to abandon you. That's what he tells his disciples. I'm going away, but I'm not going to abandon you. Now consider for a moment their dependence upon him and how dependent upon them they were. It is brought to light in this passage by the adjective orphans. Some translations use the word comfortless, but the word is orphans. And what do you say? I'm not going to leave you that. What is an orphan? Orphan, we know what that is. What an, who an orphan is, is, is one that has been deprived of parents, left with no one to provide for them emotionally, physically, mentally, to be oversighting, uh, oversight of, of them, to protect them, to provide for them in all ways. That is a one that is in complete dependence. The word leave, it means to abandon with no further thought, no further care. What's Jesus saying? He says, I'm not going to do that to you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. And this, this very concisely points or paints to the, the, the picture of absolute dependence that the disciples had upon Jesus. They depended on him for everything. Everything, every aspect of their life. Because when they decided to follow him, they left everything else. This is the betrayal of faith, friends, for, for Christians, too. That's what it means when we bear our cross and leave everything to follow Jesus. With Jesus, everything is okay. Even if they're suffering with that. Without Jesus... We are helpless as orphans. And Jesus previously had said in verse 16, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And he follows that with this amazing promise. I, Jesus is, I say, Jesus is saying, I will come to you. I will come to you. Now, what does that mean? You know, there's a lot of debate on this, and uh, there's three basic ways that people look at it, and, and one is the resurrection, that he's going to come to them in the resurrection. That's certainly true. 
Another way is this is referring to the second coming, that he is going to come again uh, and, and come to them at that time. Or is it possible that this means something different than that, either of those two, while those are both true? I want you just to, just to consider for a second the Great Commission and what Jesus says in that. He says and ends it with this, and behold, I am with you, what? Always. I am with you always to the end of the age. What is he saying here when he says, I will come with you? And in Matthew, at the Great Commission, Jesus says, I will be with you forever. There's something we have to understand about that. Jesus says that after the resurrection, after he's been resurrected, he says that prior to ascending, I will be with you forever. Consider what it says in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who what? Lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I believe that what Jesus is saying, I will come to you, is that Jesus comes to the believer at salvation. If Jesus is promising the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he's promising himself, yes, Jesus would come to them after the resurrection. And at that time, they would see him. They would see him. But yet, Jesus ascended after that and was no longer physically with them. And he confirmed to them prior to that, I'll be with you forever. Now, let me just say something. I want you to listen carefully how I say this is, today this is no longer a promise for the Christian. It is a reality to the Christian. We're not waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. This promise has been fulfilled. This is not a future thing that we're waiting for. This is a present reality of the believer. It's not something we're waiting for. It's something that already is. Consider for a second what a comforting reminder that the spite, the reality of another reality, and that is of human loneliness, we're never truly alone. Jesus is always with us. Let me, let me be clear, this is not some mystical experiencing God sort of thing, you know that whole thing that took place years ago. It's not that. We can't conjure up some way to experience God. We can't do certain things to have the presence of God more abundant than at other times. It's a reality of the Christian life. It is a reality of being a Christian that we are in union with God. It, it, it is sometimes, I don't know if it's humorous to me or if it bothers me, I don't know which one it is more of, when we say, well, we're two or more are gathered, there he is. When isn't he in our presence? When isn't he with us? That verse is referring to church discipline. John MacArthur says this, the Trinity lives in every Christian. The Trinity, three in one, in every Christian. There isn't some experience that you can have that takes you into some communion with God that you don't all otherwise have. There isn't some musical formula that can induce some kind of fellowship with God that without the music can't happen. There certainly isn't a drug that's going to do anything other than alter your mind and make you think something's happening that's not. Every believer is in constant, unending, eternal communion with the Trinity. It's not something we can manifest. It's something that is. This is overwhelming just by... By, by the, the sheer fact that I, I don't understand it. But it also gives us a very acute perspective that without Jesus, 
we are utterly hopeless without him. But we are not without hope. And those that are in Christ are not without hope. Those that are in Christ are not hopeless. We, we are not ever alone in Christ. We have constant communion with the triune God. And this should affect every detail of our lives. Why is the church constantly reforming? Why must the church constantly be reforming? Until we have made Christ the center of everything we've done. Until Christ captures every thought and motive of our heart. And until that time, we're going to always be reforming. This should hold us captive. That we are in constant communion with the triune God. Whether our actions and the way we live our lives manifest that. How does this look? How does this look? In verse 19, Jesus says, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. You know, the first part of this verse here, it refers to his death. That is when the unsaved, the unregenerate world, that's what's referred to as the world, the sinful world that has rejected Christ, that has killed Christ, mm -hmm. that the last time that they see Christ is when they hang Him on the cross. In, in His resurrection, the Gospels only record that Jesus appearing to the disciples. In, in the book of Acts, you have the exception of His appearance to Saul. You read of other appearances, but the, the only thing that the Bible paints for us a picture of is that those that are either disciples or going to become disciples are the ones that Jesus sees. In his incarnation, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him, right? In his incarnation, uh, the, the world, though created through him, did not recognize him, but they could see him physically. Uh, they could see him as he walked physically with them, but not after the cross. The Bible doesn't teach us that. It doesn't show us that. Only those that were disciples or those that would become disciples. Saul turning into Paul, for instance. The world says the world won't see him anymore. The lost still cannot see him. Their eyes are uh, blinded by the prince of this world. They cannot see Jesus still today. And Jesus ascended to the Father. They have no sign of that. Yet we're told also in the Bible that there's going to come a day in which everyone will see him. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of earth will well on account of him. Even so, amen. There's coming a day when the whole entire world will see him and recognize him and bow before him as Lord. Whether their knee is bent for them or they bend it because they recognize him as Lord and want to worship him. He will come one day. Recently I had posted something on the internet um, about eschatology, the study of end times. And I, I had a friend that saw it. He's an atheist, and he responded. He said, uh, I don't, I don't want to be mean here, Rob, but if in another 2,000 years, and 4,000 years, you know, it's 4,016, it, it, and Christ hasn't returned yet, will Christians still be saying any time now? I said, yep, Christians will be saying any time now. They will be saying any time now. You see, it's a matter of authority in this. This Bible tells us Jesus will return. Uh, the determining factor of that is not our impatient or our estimation of when God should work out his plan. The authority on that is that the Bible tells us Jesus will return and every eye will see him at that time. But it's not hard to understand that the world will no longer see him, is it? It's not hard to understand that. The world doesn't recognize him. The world doesn't read the scriptures. It takes no effect. They don't have the eyes to, to read it. They don't have the ears to hear it. But Jesus says something very difficult to understand. He says, but you will see me. 
What does he mean? It's very true. They're going to see him when he's resurrected. They're going to see him. They're going to walk with him. They're going to spend time with him. But it's more important that we look at the context of what it's saying here to find out what he means. First, identify who the you is. It's the disciples. It's the disciples. In chapter 17, Jesus' prayers uh, is in an encapsulating prayer of everything that he has said in chapter 14, 15, and 16, and it applies to all believers. But the disciples, that's the church. That becomes the church. So how do we see Jesus? We see Jesus in his continuing works. We see Jesus in salvation. We see Jesus in sanctification. We see Jesus in the works that he does. His mission being carried out by the Holy Spirit through his disciples, through the church. That's how we see Jesus. Now, if Jesus and the Father indwell the believer, as Jesus states over and over again, will this not manifest itself in some tangible way? So what Jesus says here about those outside of the world. In chapter 13, verse 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's a manifestation of Christ in the church. Now, people will recognize you. They will know something is different beyond uh, everything else, that the church is different. There's some observable evidence that Christ is in the church. Forgiveness, self-sacrificial love, washing one another's feet. The world is going to see those things. They're going to see it different they won't have the answer as to why it's different. Because they cannot see Jesus. Because they cannot see Jesus. How do, we, how do we see the presence of Jesus in the church? How do we see the presence of Jesus now? I, I think it's this. I'm not being dogmatic or say this is the, the only way. I, I'm just saying this, this is what I, I see. is a group of people striving together for Christ's likeness, not neglecting the communion of the saints. I think that that's how, I think that that's how we see it. It's a group of people striving together for Christ's likeness, recognizing we haven't arrived, but we have victory in Christ. I think we see it as a church that is marked by purity, Taking sin seriously. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We see that transformation taking place in a group of people. I can't help but think that an implication of this text is that the church represents the presence of Christ. You represent the presence of Christ. Christians see that. They say, that, well, that, that's, that's easy to answer why that church is so different. It's because of Jesus. The world cannot see this. That's why the world will, would never understand church discipline. The, the, the world cannot understand why we would want to strive for the purity of the church by practicing. Forget the word discipline, but restoration. The world cannot see that, cannot understand. Christians get it. And Jesus continues here. He says, because I live, you will live. Because I live, you will live. You know, the first point here is this dependency, and, and that is recognizing the sovereignty of the triune God. You re recognize the sovereignty of God by recognizing your dependence. And this, this statement, because I live, you also will live, 
states it so clearly, our dependence upon Christ. And there are two things that this verse, this part of the verse establishes. One is absolute security. Your faith, your life, that is salvation, is indestructible. Jesus has life within himself. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Colossians 1.17, in him all things hold together. Security is rooted in Jesus. In order for your security to die, Jesus would have to cease living. Our life is indestructible in Christ because Christ is indestructible. His resurrection guarantees our salvation and preservation. Not only gives us absolute security, it gives us absolute dependence too. And don't miss that. Your salvation is fully dependent upon Jesus. There is nothing you can do to earn it or to keep it or, or, or to maintain it. It is because He lives that I can have life. It is because He lives that I am able to live and do live. It is because He lives that eternal life is a present reality for the Christian. Number one, we recognize the sovereignty of God. Number two, we will have knowledge of the triune God. Look at verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. In that day, I don't believe that's referring to like, you know, a set day, July 12, 2000. It's not, I don't think it's referring to a specific day. It's referring to a, 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 a period of time. Because you notice that it, it is tied to the giving of the Spirit. When did this happen? Pentecost. Pentecost on. That's in that day. I believe that's what it's referring to. So to the disciples, Jesus pronounces of once again the mutual indwelling of the Father and the Son. In chapter 14, verse 11, he says, Believe that me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And he, he repeats this. And while it's true that no human mind can fully understand the Trinity... Jesus does say, we will recognize it, and we will know it. How? Why would we know it? How would we know it? Well, you know, we could say, well, we're baptized into this. But here's why. is because that's what the Bible teaches us. Why did the disciples know this? Look at chapter 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? After Jesus is resurrected, why will it make sense then? Because Jesus told them. Because of Jesus' words is why we will know. That's the same way we know, is the same way the disciples know. is because Jesus told them and the Spirit indwells us and illuminates it to us. God has introduced himself as triune. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with the mutual and dwelling of the Father and the Son. He says, and you in me, and I in you. And so they are promised the Holy Spirit, and now they are promised Jesus. It, it could look like this in chapter 15, verse 5. It sort of paints a picture of it. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him. You see, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost to indwell, to live in believers forever, believers became united in union with Jesus forever at that time as well. The New Testament is full of examples of this, and we don't have time to go through every one of them, but let me give you a few. In Him... We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace in Him. If you look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Verse 21, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of of God. If you look over at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. This is throughout the whole entire 
New Testament, that we are in Christ. What does this mean for those that are in Christ? Let me give you one. Chapter 8, verse 1 of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And friends, that is the best news we have heard all week. There is no condemnation. We are in Christ, but yet we are also taught Christ is in us. And I in you, Jesus says in Romans chapter 8, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. You look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, a very important implication. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Very clear. Very clear. The reality for the believer, it leads to this third point, and that is love from the triune God. Love from the triune God. Look at verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Love from the triune God. At first glance, this seems to demonstrate that we can earn God's love, which would completely contradict my sermon from a few weeks ago in verse 15. That's not what it's saying. Uh, whoever, whoever has my commandments, uh, it's very literally saying the having one of Jesus' commands. Whenever you find that word whoever, and like whoever believes in John 3, 16, it, it, it's usually, uh, if we translated it literally, it wouldn't sound good in English. The having one of Jesus' commands is the keeping one of Jesus' commands. That one is the loving one of Jesus, is what it's saying. The having one, the keeping one, is the loving one. That's the meaning of that. This verse reveals how, really, how Jesus will be seen also, isn't it? By the loving ones. It's marked by obedience, by keeping. Jesus is made very vividly real by obedience to him in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of very tough trials and trying to figure uh, what we're to do when, when, when it's easier to go against Christ, but we stay Obedient to Christ. Jesus is made vividly real in those times. What does it mean? It, having his commands. It means to, to be instructed in them. Not just knowledge of them, but beyond that. That is, that is, I have hidden your word in my heart type of having. Keeping his commands is the one that is having the ongoing work of conforming our life to what his commands are. And that one... That having one, that keeping one, is the lo loving one. That is the one who loves Jesus. And love for Jesus is defined by active transformation and obedience in the believer. You know, that's why we can't just turn our head and sneeze at sin when a fellow brother or sister in Christ sins. We're just demonstrating that love for Jesus is not important. Notice the love that the loving one receives. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. This love is poured out to the having one. This love is poured out to the keeping one throughout all of eternity. And by the way, this love itself is rooted in eternity. In love he predestined. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And that was rooted in love before the foundations of the world were even laid. If you ever feel unloved, we must be reminded that Christ in Christ, we are recipients of the greatest love. There is a love that gave the Father gave His only Son so that believing on Him, we will have eternal life. That we will be the recipients 
of his great love. But not only that, but we will also in turn love him back as being the having ones and the keeping ones of Jesus' commands and demonstrating our own love for him. And he will pour his love out on us. And in contrast to the world who no longer sees Jesus, listen to what he says. He says, I will manifest myself to him. I will manifest myself to him. What, what a promise. What a promise, you know. It's not something I can understand, but I know that I'm changed by it. I know that it, it, it is changing. It is transforming. We will... In this promise is we will recognize the sovereignty of the triune God. We will have knowledge of the triune God. And we will have love from the triune God. I don't know where you are this morning. But let me just close with asking you this. Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Because there is no condemnation for those in Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these promises that are made very real for the Christian now. It is the Christian experience. We thank you for this communion eternally given to the believer. We thank you for your great love. May we show our love to you in response. It's in Jesus' name.